Yes, and they Hello. are live. Welcome over to you, Chad right. and Helen. Hello. Bye bye. Bye. Um, great. Well, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending our talk today. Not quite games, a journey of making. Uh, my name is Chad. And I'm Helen. And we're just really happy to be sharing our journey with you today. Um, before we start, we would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're streaming from today, the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and the violence of the colonial project is still ongoing. <clears throat> um, we also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the atrocities that are happening in Palestine and wanted to express our solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, so yeah, before we start, we just thought um, we give a bit of a background about ourselves individually and also as an artist duo. Um, so I'm Chad Toprak, my pronouns are he, him, and I mostly identify as an experimental game designer, um, independent curator, um, and I'm also the outgoing artistic director of Free Play, um, the world's longest running independent games festival. Um, my time with Free Play is going to end soon, uh, hence the outgoing. Um, uh, but free play will keep going on as well. Um, I like making um, analog and digital games. I make uh, alt controllers, uh, interactive play experiences, and public art. And my name's Helen Clock. My pronouns are she, her. And I call myself a multimedia artist and designer. I make playful installations, experimental games, and public art activations that kind of often involves games and play in public space. And my practice often blends the digital and the physical together. Um, hence my love for alt controllers and I just love to craft playful experiences that extend beyond the screen. And so um, we kind of work as, a, as an artist duo now. Do you feel like your whole individual practices have changed much since then? Not really. <laughs> I feel like there were already kind of like a lot of overlaps to begin with. And as an artist duo, you know, we've worked a lot on like public art activations around Melbourne, um, a lot of kind of interactive installation type work, video games for museums, um, alt controllers for game jams, and just a whole mix of things which aren't considered, I guess, traditional video games, um, things that kind of at the intersection of art games, play, and technology, and hence the title of our talk, Not Quite Games. Not Quite Games. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, we've been collaborating together for about two years now, and we thought maybe the best way to break down our journey is to kind of reflect on um, some of our projects, um, We'll attempt to kind of summarize our artistic practice once we've uh, kind of gone through some of the projects that we've worked on and then see see what the, the common themes that kind of emerge have emerged over the last couple of years. Um, once we've done that, we'll go through um, some of our lessons learned, you know, um, the good stuff, the bad stuff. <laughs> um, and then and then we'll end with uh, just kind of discussing where we think we're headed. 
Um, so Street Take Games was kind of like the first project we collaborated on as an artist duo. Um, it's a temporary public art installation that involves creating a play space from social distancing tapes on the ground. And this play space is used to introduce the public to kind of a series of street and playground games that we have redesigned uh, with social distancing in mind. And we play these games with the public through these facilitated play sessions. So think of Foursquare, Tunnel Ball, What's a Time, Mr. Wolf type games, but they've all been redesigned without any kind of body contact or touch. And essentially we're kind of subverting the role of these kind of social distancing takes from something that is usually used to kind of isolate people and keep people apart to um, bring people together through play. And we had initially conceptualized this idea as a direct response to COVID-19, um, especially during a time where there was just a lot of fear around the pandemic, like what it means to play in public space again, you know, how do we play tag when we can't tag each other anymore? And Melbourne especially went through a really tough time in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we went through six lockdowns in total, 267 days of hard lockdown. And um, yeah, and we, we just wanted to create something just to help encourage people to come outside and play again after lockdown and to help foster a sense of community and activate public space in a safe way. And yeah, we saw this as an opportunity to pitch this to local city councils. Um, we were very lucky to have received funding from two councils here to further develop this idea and make it a reality. And um, we managed to kind of host Street Tech Games multiple times across um, 2020, 2021, through an informal playtesting session with the community, at a community festival with a very multicultural demographic um, at Free Play in 2021, last year. That was great. And also Street Tape Games kind of made its international debut as part of Jump, um, a play festival in London in the, in the UK, uh, which we're really grateful for to see, you know, Street Tape Games being played by people outside of Australia as well. Um, and yeah, there was also a lot of interest in street tape games uh, from researchers and academics. And we ended up writing this article about street tape games as part of a research project called the Play Observatory. And because of that involvement, street tape games is now also included as part of an online exhibition called Play in the Pandemic, uh, which is curated by the Young BNA Museum in the UK. And that's something we're, we're really, really proud of. Mm. So, well, well what would you say is like your <clears throat> your favorite thing about this project? Um, gosh, so many. I think it's just seeing people play in public space again, especially especially after those lockdowns when you know the streets were just empty, you know, and and just seeing that connection between people being very physically present with one another especially you know during lockdowns we were all just staring at zoom screens right digital online <laughs> screens and everyone's just in this rectangle um and then just to be physically present with one another I thought mm. that was very special how about you um I think my favorite moment was when after the free play edition of street tape games we were approached by a mother um uh, who had brought her daughter in and mm. she expressed how important it was to have um, these play spaces in the city, especially, especially in, in urban cities where, you know, it's really hard to find things like playgrounds and things like that. So just having a space for their, for their for children to play, um, she said was like super important to her. So that mm. was probably my favourite. Great. Um, and so while we were developing street tape games, um, we got approached by another council um, who was interested in the work that we were doing, um, especially public art installations that were kind of, you know, socially distanced. And they wanted something similar for their um, large outdoor plaza space. Uh, and this is kind of how Rainbow Paths came about. Um, for this particular edition of Rainbow Paths, we this was our first um, 
first edition, and we we called it Rainbow Bird Playground because it was in the in the shape of a of a rainbow bird, um, and it used giant tape and 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 chalk um, insulation as as part of the insulation, um, and we embedded um, mini games, um, the the yellow circular things that you see, um, and they're kind of embedded as part of the um, the the installation, and they connect these colourful. Um, branching paths to each other. And so <clears throat> each one of these mini games um, range from simple things like clapping your hands and moving your body to finding hidden objects and noticing things in your environment around you. Um, each marker is socially distanced and, and, and does they don't require any additional props or devices to play. And so all you really do is you kind of read the prompt and you enact the, the mini game. Um, and unlike street tape games, uh, Rainbow Paths doesn't require any facilitation. Um, and it evokes a more free form and ambient form of play. Um, uh, and what we found is that even, even if kids weren't following the rules and instructions that we had designed for them, um, they still had a great time just walking along the colourful tapes um, and, and making up their own games as they, as they traverse the playscape. Um, Rainbow Bird Playground was kind of our first major public art installation. Um, it was a great learning opportunity um, and we were really ambitious <laughs> working on something so large scale for the first time. Um, and um, we, we learned a lot from it, like how volatile and time consuming chalk spray can be um, and how dependent it is on good weather. Um, and we had some not great times <laughs> with rain at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, and so eventually for, for the next iteration of Rainbow Paths, we, we actually switched to um, mainly using colourful tape instead. Um, we didn't have a great time with chalk spray. <laughs> um, and so this next iteration of Rainbow Paths was called Rainbow Laneway um, because it took place in one of uh, Melbourne's most prominent laneways um, as part of like a, an annual citywide festival. Um, there was a lot of traffic in this laneway. Um, and so we were really blessed to see a lot of children kind of interacting with and, and loving the installation. And not only that, you know, kids, kids were also playing with their parents and, and, and their families. For example, in this particular game, um, the, the mini game prompt is sing or dance to the next stop. And um, we were delighted to see the mother actually take out her phone to play music so that the her and and, and the daughter can actually dance together. We also saw kids playing with grandparents, um, which is, you know, such a rare and beautiful sight to behold. Um, we, we saw a lot of intergenerational play as part of this um, installation. And, and I think what makes Rainbow Paths so accessible for both young kids and older generation to join in and play is because um, the installation doesn't require any additional technology, you know? Um, it's got a very low barrier to entry. Um, we did a version of um, Rainbow Paths for uh, an indoor um, space. Um, this particular one is inside a, an empty warehouse. Um, the organizers needed a, an activation in the middle of the space to kind of fill in that, that empty void. Um, that's kind of, that was kind of in the middle of, um, these stalls. And so, um, kind of encourage people to play while they transition from market stall to market stall as well. Um, and so it was great as an activation to encourage play in, in this sort of liminal space as well. Our next iteration of Rainbow Pass took place at a street corner. 
um, just outside State Library Victoria, which is a, a large library that we have here in Melbourne. Um, and it's right in the heart of our, our CBD, the Central Business District. Um, and and this, this particular space is usually where people are rushing kind of from point A to point B. Um, there's a tram stop right nearby as well. And um, it was delightful to see people actually slow down and, and to stop and look at their environment and appreciate their environment a bit more. Um, we had people of all ages playing in the space. And um, for this version of um, Rainbow Pass, we decided to use more durable vinyls to replace the colored tapes that we had used up until now. Um, using these custom printed vinyls um, gave us more flexibility with the sorts of shapes and patterns that we were able to introduce into the play space. Um, and what we love about Rainbow Paths is that it's also modular and adaptable to the space that it's um, designed for. A lot of um, the mini games that we have are often site specific. For example, um, the latest edition of Rainbow Paths is situated outside a pop-up library space. And so we designed some new games, especially for this new space. For example, this marker, you know, what does your dream library um, look like? We had other things like picking your favorite books, um, finding some um, farm animals that the library had cut up and kind of pasted in, on their, um, their windows and things like that. And yeah, overall, it was a, a big delight to work on. Um, yeah, so what would you say uh, in terms of this project was your favourite kind of moment or thing about it? Um, for me, I think my favourite was um, just seeing grandparents play with their grandkids. I think oh, that, that was, was mine. Oh, really? <laughs> that was my favourite moment. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was just special to see intergenerational play and yeah. just seeing seeing grandparents play with yeah. their I remember there was a particular instance when we were installing for the State Library Victoria. It was on the day of the installation. So we were still literally applying the vinyls on the ground. And there was a grandfather and I think his two grandchildren who came over and was asking about the installation. And um, yeah, and basically they were literally playing the games as we were installing. So we'll put a marker down um, and they would come over and play that game. And well, meanwhile, we were like moved on to the next marker and they would come and they played every single game. They that played every single the game. That was quite like nice. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in addition <coughs> to kind of public art installations, um, uh, late last year, we also got approached by the National Gallery of Victoria, um, also known as NGV here in Melbourne. Um, to collaborate on making a children's video game for their dedicated children's kind of exhibition space. And this is quite different for the NGV. Um, you know, usually they have more interactive exhibits, but A Walk in the Bush, which is the name of the children's video game, was probably kind of their first actual kind of video game that they've commissioned for that space. And the exhibition was called The Gecko and the Mermaid. Um, the game was based on the artwork of a famous, a very famous Aboriginal artist here in Australia, um, where children can learn about the Aboriginal culture and the different activities um, they do in the six seasons of the year in the game itself. Um, so, for example, uh, there might be a level about hunting kangaroos or catching fish and birds or digging for yams for food. Um, and the game kind of uses uh, a joystick and a push button as its input. And yeah, the kids loved it. Like often they would kind of play with their parents, especially the younger kids. And we really, really enjoyed um, this collaboration with NGV. Um, we found that kind of museums in general have these dedicated spaces that are quite perfect for the type of work that we do, um, you know, interactive exhibits and installations and Currently, we're kind of working again with the NGV for their upcoming Picasso exhibition, which is really exciting. Mm, mm. Yeah, so well, favourite moment for this project? You go first. <laughs> I go first. Yeah. No, you go first. I need to have a think about it. Oh, that. okay. Um, I think my favourite moment 
um, working on this project was um, receiving the artwork from the, the Aboriginal artist and just seeing how beautiful her artwork was. Um, and un unfortunately, as we were working on the project, she, uh, she passed away, which is very unfortunate. Um, and so at the end, this ended up being something that was created in her memory. Um, but yeah. Mm. I think for me, it was kind of animating her artwork and almost kind of bringing, bringing them to life in mm. a way, in, in, another, in another format. Um, yeah. And seeing things move around and those kind of, kind of those mark baking things um, in, as part of her artwork kind of coming alive through animation. Mm, I thought mm. that was quite special as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, on to our next game. Um, so amongst all the big projects that we were working on, um, we also tried to take some breaks where we could. Um, it, it was at, the, at this point pretty overwhelming um, working on so many projects. So um, we tried to take some breaks from time to time. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes we'd, we'd find ourselves working on game jams. Uh, and, and for us, like, game jams are, are way more relaxed way of, of spending time on, on working on creative projects. Um, game jams are great because they're, you know, low stakes and we can work on things that are quite experimental. Um, and, you know, if, if things don't work out, that's fine as well, you know. Uh, we don't, there's no pressure of delivering a, a polished or a finished product at the end of the jam. Um, and so, the, the jam that we participated uh, for Paint Mixer was actually the Amaze Alt Control Game Jam that was held online um, and it was led by Torsten and Tatiana. Um, we had 24 hours to make something, um, but because we were based in Australia, we had a little less than that. I think we, 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 we probably we just slept. We slept, <laughs> we slept for most of it, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we ended up creating this in maybe eight eight hours or something like that. Um, and yeah, for this game jam, um, we made this game called Paint Mixer 3000. Um, we were kind of inspired by a series of TikTok videos where um, they would, um, a painter would kind of add different colors to a, to a white colored paint bucket and then it would get mixed. And then part of the, the game was to try and guess what the end color would be without seeing you know the color form in real time and so we tried to create something similar to that so paint paint mixer 3000 is a two-player alt control game where players have to match the color of um of their paint bucket with um a randomly uh, generated color so um they do that by turning these red green and blue dials um, but the catch is that the colors of your paint buckets are hidden as you turn the dials. So the, there's three paint buckets. The one in the middle is the one that you're trying to match. And then the ones on either side are your other players' buckets. Um, so you start the game by um, um, holding onto a, a button on the side, which randomly generates a color. And then you hit this show and hide button. When you hit it, um, all the LEDs turn off. And that's when you start dialing the LEDs and trying to get it as close to that, um, that color as possible. And then when you're ready to have the big reveal, you just hit that button again and then it'll reveal. And then the person who has the closest to that color is the winner. Um, and this allows for some really hilarious moments, um, especially during the, the reveal moment. Um, and here's a quick video to kind of demonstrate the game as well.
Yeah, so favorite thing about this project? <laughs> I think I think my favorite thing about this project was actually playing it. <laughs> <laughs> after after we had finished it, we just played so many times because it was just absolutely hilarious playing um play on it we think, got pretty competitive i think we got pretty competitive um it was just a, a delight to play yeah i think for me it's the process of actually making the the little paint buckets like i really like that process of kind of crafting things with my hands and and because what you was a jam like obviously you know we couldn't you know laser cut anything at the maker's space like it was just finding random objects around the house and yeah. trying to make it make it work yeah and just yeah. being creative yeah. Uh, yeah we were also in lockdown yeah yeah that's right so yeah, yeah. good good project <laughs> it's quite fun oh there we go <laughs> um so another game we made as part of uh, a game jam was quite contrary and we made this <coughs> the global game jam this year uh to the theme of duality and quite contrary is a card game that's played outdoors so um, players will kind of pick three cards from a from a deck that we have designed and the the goals kind of have to take photos of objects in their surroundings to match the prompts on the card so for example the prompts might be happy face sad face and they have to find those things in the environment or you know long and short giant and tiny rough and smooth surfaces and so on so we really wanted to kind of create something that sparked curiosity um, in players and encourage them to kind of go outside and observe their surroundings in a very kind of lo-fi relaxed way. Um, so we'll show a quick video of how the game works. Mm. So, what, what would you say is your your favorite thing about this project? <laughs> um, I think it was like I didn't expect like when we when we kind of posted it online like after the jam ended, I kind of didn't expect anyone to kind of pay any attention to it. It was just like a, a little thing that we did. But uh, we actually had someone um, on Twitter, a friend on Twitter, who actually went and um, played this game twice. Um, while he was going for his walks and um, I thought that was very very special to me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and their photos were fantastic as well they yeah. were very artistic in the end their interpretations were great yeah I think that was also probably my favorite moment as well um, but also I was really another thing that I really liked about this project was um, um, the 
the quality of the the cards that we had designed like the graphics of the cards um and and also how we adapted it to um to an online version as well because like you know it's it's a card game yes but if you don't have the cards or if you don't have the printing facilities to print the cards um we also, also yeah made a twine version we made a twine game. version yeah. and it was kind of nice and accessible in that regard as well which i really liked yeah mm. Um, and so, um, this is our most recent project, um, Musical Monoliths, and this project literally just launched this week. Um, it's another public art installation, um, but unlike most of our other projects, this one was like heavily um, digital and electronics focused. Um, um, it involves four giant pillars. Each of them were about two meters tall. Um, and the idea is that you just play music with them. Each monolith is a unique musical instrument. And as you place your hand close to the surface of each panel, um, they light up and play a musical note. Um, and the idea is that you can play music play music through waving your hands or um, moving your body around these pillars. Um, and you create mu a musical symphony with, with other players that are playing around you. The installation is currently set up at the State Library of Victoria in their um, Keith Murdoch gallery. And, um, and here's kind of a photo of them as we were setting up. Um, yeah, and, and here's, we'll, we'll play a quick video for you all. Um, it's not polished or anything because we, we literally just <laughs> took videos as we were setting up and hurriedly kind of mashed it together. So, but it'll, it'll give you an idea of how it works. Favorite thing about this project? Favorite thing? Um, oh gosh, that's a it's a tricky one. Um, I think my favorite moment was just seeing it in the space, finally in its working form. Um, I think it was super satisfying to just finally see it complete and and in public. Um, because up until then, we weren't sure if it was going to work. We weren't sure if, you know, if there was going to be any glitches or bugs. Um, I think we were both pretty anxious in the lead up to it. But once it was there and once it was running and we saw people interacting with it, um, I was like, nice. This was, yeah. this was a good project and it was worthwhile. Yeah. And I think it was also a project that's been in the works for a long time. Like originally we were planning to to do this last year, but because of COVID and many other reasons, it got postponed. We didn't know it was happening this year and it did. And so I think it was just like, you know, it was almost like a year and a half in the in the making. As well. yeah. So yeah. What would you say is your favorite moment? I think for me it was designing the sound. Like, uh, yeah. I think like, um, cause I don't get to do much kind of music sound related stuff much yeah. anymore in kind of my, my usual practice. Um, but I used to, I used to play the cello, mm -hmm. um, and, um, it was just get just kind of like dabbling back into kind of sound and music stuff and just yeah. designing the sounds for each, um, each pillow I thought was a, a was a really nice activity mm, to do. Yeah. yeah, we use MIDI as the the like the the back end for it, and so we ended up kind of 
uh, layering different MIDI sounds. And, yeah, and yeah. we also have like a guitar pedal in there that kind of enhances the sound. Yeah. Um, but yeah, fine tuning those sounds and stuff was a really- It was really satisfying. It was really yeah. fun. Like yeah. once we got it, we were like, this is it. You yeah. know, this is, it sounds great. Um, yeah, so we hope that by showing kind of the, some of these projects that we worked on, it would kind of give a good example of kind of the breadth of our practice. Um, we find that we are often work at the intersection of, you know, public art, museum interactives, games, installations and play, and kind of, unfortunately, there really isn't like a single term that can kind of, I think, really summarize all of this succinctly and I I mean I call myself a multimedia artist and designer because of this <laughs> yeah and and I usually tend to call myself an experimental game designer because of this as well as opposed to you know an independent game designer or just a game designer or developer um, because it's so out of the ordinary you know like the traditional ways of making and publishing and releasing and selling a game um, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's actually really hard to describe what we do to other people. We really struggle with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but in terms of few common themes that are kind of <clears throat> integral to our artistic practice, like, um, firstly, we're not afraid to just work on purely physical projects um, and only kind of include technology if we feel like we need to. Mm. Um, we find that we're often quite critical of technology and how it's used in our projects and only use it when we f we know that it's it's adding, used for a purpose. Yeah, it's yeah. like adding to the experience. Um, so for example, like Chad said, you know, quite contrary, we, we made an online twine version because, um, you know, not everyone has access to a printer to print out the, the cards. And so we thought the twine version would make it more accessible. Um, you know, we've often see a lot of projects where technology is kind of used as a gimmick and, you know, and also technology can also be a barrier um, when it comes to access, you know, not everyone has the latest gadgets or devices um, to experience the piece of work that you do, you know, from phones to VR and so we do like to use technology, but only when it's meaningful and necessary. Um, and you'd often find that technology is quite invisible in our work. Like you, we don't like kind of have people always holding onto a phone or a device. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the point of our projects aren't never really the technology itself. It's more about the experience, um, which kind of, you know, brings us to our next point is that, you know, we often describe our work as experiences rather than, products you know we don't we don't charge money for any of our projects um or, or for people to play uh, or experience you know we're not really looking to to make a profit per se out of this like yes it would be nice if we could sustain our arts practice but we're not we're not trying to turn it into a, a business you know um where we monetize what we make and things like that and as long as we get paid for our time through artist fees um it's it's important for us to try and keep our projects free for the community you know um, free and accessible to experience um, and so in this way our work is all about the lived experience and we get a lot of joy and satisfaction from witnessing people playing um, the stuff that we make and sharing those moments with others mm. Would you say that like our work is not quite complete until it's been played? I think so. Yeah. I think so. If we make something and it's never played, um, then we I, I would feel like it's not complete. Um, yeah. and, and often like it's really important for me and, and for both of us to be there and, and witness it being played as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of where where the project comes to an end. Yeah. It's like we've done it and we've seen people experience it. Yeah. yeah. And because our practice is so varied, um, we like to be quite open and flexible and versatile with our skill sets. And we feel that, you know, that has kind of worked to our advantage, like by not pigeonholing ourselves into just a particular thing, like, you know, programming or like, you know, 3D or whatever it is. Um, like, you know, our practice is quite broad. 
Yeah. And um, in some ways, we really enjoy working on such a wide variety of things. Um, you know, every day is different. I feel like, you know, and often because we have multiple projects going on at the same time as well, like no two days are the same. Mm, yeah. That's right. That's right. All right. And so wrapping up, like, what are the lessons we've learned so far? Mm. Uh, first one is probably around burnout and self-care. We're not going to sugarcoat this one. <laughs> um, being independent artists requires a lot of work, you know. Um, pay is often not great um, and you really need to be organised, self-driven um, and, and do a really good job managing your time as well. Um, you're often having to wear many hats, you know, on, on top of actually making the thing, you're having to read through and sign contracts, dealing with admin and project management work, um, applying for grants, doing site visits, um, liaising with a whole variety of stakeholders. And it's, it's basically a lot of hustling um, when, when you're independent and when you're a freelancer. Um, and so as a result of that, um, we end up burning out quite a bit, especially during crunch periods. Like I think even now we're pretty, we're pretty exhausted. Um, we've had two very intense weeks. Um, and I think we probably work like 50 hour weeks or something. Um, and, and, and also this is kind of me coming straight out of directing free play for five years as well. Um, but you know, and living in a <laughs> and, and living in a pandemic. Um, so something that I think we can definitely do better is self-care. Taking more breaks um, is more easier said than done, but like actually scheduling in breaks um, and, and setting boundaries around work as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's also really hard to do all of that whilst you're emerging and establishing your independent artistic practice because you've got all these opportunities coming your way and you don't want to really say no to them mm. either just because they're you know the gems and 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 they're also your source of income you know mm. which kind of leads out leads us to our next point um you know grants and funding like funding here in melbourne is pretty interesting like you know there's some great funding programs for games uh, but the criteria is still very limited and focused on kind of digital and screen-based games. So we actually mostly get our funding through arts grants and local city council funds. Um, and, you know, one thing we thought we, we did do well um, is creating kind of timely and relevant projects or work that responded to the pandemic. And, mm. you know, through Street Tech Games and Rainbow Paths, we were actually kind of, those were our starting points um, in the arts, um, feel like kind of that was like a foot in the door type moment. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's all about kind of strategic alignment, right? You know, yeah. aligning our work with the council's goals as well, but obviously not compromising on our artistic intention or our integrity. Yeah. Um, and another thing that, you know, we want to mention is how important writing as a, as a skill is, like um, especially writing about your own work in a succinct and clear way, like, I don't even remember the number of grants I've written since I graduated at the end of 2020. Mm, like, you know, mm. how many grants have you written? <laughs> oh, I've I've lost count of how many uh, how many grants I've written. Um, you know, back <laughs> when I was directing free play, I was probably writing three or four grants a year, um, possibly more. You know, um, and 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 then when we started working together, it was like another. <laughs> two maybe three a year on top of that so yeah. I don't know I've probably written like 30 grants so far <laughs> yeah so if you do want to go down the grant route for your project like you know learn to write well I would say yeah um, yeah and then finally um yeah the, the one last thing we want to talk about is the importance of seeking collaborators with shared values you know um we think early on in our careers it's really easy to just want to collaborate with anyone you know, take on every single opportunity that comes your way. Um, but I think the more we work, the more we realise that we want to form relationships with people and, and that, that aren't just transactional, you know. 
not one-off things. We want to build ongoing relationships where there is trust and respect uh, that goes both ways. Um, and our recommendation is to know who you're dealing with um, and pick your allies and pick your fights accordingly. Um, I would, we would say don't waste your time or energy on projects that don't match your values or your identity or your career trajectory. Um, and that's really hard, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, especially when you're dealing with larger organizations or people in positions of power who can also be gatekeepers to even more opportunities. But yeah, we feel like that's something that, you know, we're still learning to do ourselves, um, dealing with these power dynamics, understanding that the power that we also hold, you know, as artists, um, learning to protect ourselves from exploitation, um, being aware of people's true intentions, um, and, and standing up for ourselves more as well. Um, and these are all things that I think we're getting better at, but, you know, we're still figuring out as an, as an artist duo, they're, they're things that are, I think are priorities to us. And finally, what's next for us? Um, the short answer is... We don't actually know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like we're still figuring out our identities, our values and, you know, who we want to work with, who we don't want to work with. And through all of that, also trying to seek stability as well, like possibly in the form of longer term projects. So we're not like hustling all the time. Mm. Um, feel like we're kind of, you know, currently overworking and really need to take on less projects at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, and But it's hard though, because we're only just starting out and these opportunities are golden. And, mm. You know, we also rely on the income from these projects to pay our bills and rent. So yeah. yeah, hoping the future will be kind of less crunchy and less chaotic. Yeah. We're not quite sure what the future holds right now um but we're just going with the flow and and so far it's worked really well for us not you know super planning out things just letting things come to us applying for grants where we can um and if we do get it that's great um and that also gives us opportunities to try new things you know go in directions that we never expected to be you know being very loose and 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 flexible mm. Um, we're really lucky that for the second half of this year, we've also received some funding for just creative development with no public outcome required, which means, you know, we, we can have that time and space to just tinker and learn new things. Um, and we don't have that pressure of, you know, having to deliver something and really just having that time and space to experiment and extend our creative practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we really enjoy working together. Um, we're both excited and passionate about the things that we do. Um, and we receive a lot of satis satisfaction and fulfillment and joy from, from making art together. Um, this is really rare to come by, but the fact that we can support and motivate each other in challenging times, I think really helps with art making. Um, we don't think neither of us would have been able to achieve what we've achieved over the last two years if we didn't have each other. So yeah. very, very great. Oh, <laughs> um, we also have like very complementary skills as well. Like, you know, Chad is very fluid, flexible, adaptable. And this is really useful when it comes to like, you know, when unexpected things arise or we need to make, you know, quick on the fly decisions. Mm. Yeah. And Hal is really good, like really, really good at planning. So it's, it's really useful for our projects, you know, making sure everything is accounted for and nothing falls in between the cracks. So, yeah. Yeah, and finally, we just, we really look forward to what the future holds. Like now that the pandemic is slowly easing, um, you know, we also look forward to kind of more international projects and even traveling overseas perhaps for presentation opportunities. Yeah, we would love to be at an in-person amaze at some point yeah. like I neither of us have attended an amazing person and that's definitely something on our list yeah so that's it um you know thank you so much for tuning in and listening and you know thank you amaze for having us as well and um, our contact details are here if you want to connect we'd love to hear from you we'd love to 
if there's opportunities to collaborate or if you want to pick our brains, um, you can always reach out and yeah. If you have any questions, do pop it into the Q&A channel on the Maze Discord and we'll be hanging around there for a while to answer any questions. Yeah, great. And that's, that's it from us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. What a wonderful journey. Hello. Hello. Can you see, can you see us? Hello. Hi. Yes. yes. You're still online. We You're wanted to online, ask you yes. some questions. Yes. And then oh, okay, sure and, thing. And afterwards, uh, um, for everybody else, um, there's a and a channel mm -hmm. on Discord, and then you can chat with Helen and chat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So your question first, maybe. When are you coming to a maze? <laughs> <laughs> Next year. Um, whenever it's safe to do so. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely to have you both. Absolutely, absolutely. And I was actually, this is on one thing on my list. So because, uh, do you, can you imagine that uh, there's a kind of a co-production fund where Australian artists can work together with German artists um, and create something together? Like maybe something like an artist yeah, in residence thing? Yeah, that would be thing. great. So that you can stay oh, as well yeah. a little bit longer over in Berlin. I, I, I'm just thinking loud, so I don't know. We have to check this out, but I mean, this could be something for 2023. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> One question I also have. Um, I mean, the journey is two years. It's pretty short, short journey, but I mean, you had a lot of stuff done in this two years. And uh, yeah. what, what I'm wondering is, um, where does it go for the production wise? Um, are you working with teams together or you just work alone? It's mostly just the two of us. Um, but we do collaborate with um, other people where needed. Um, so for example, we might bring um, a friend on board who does the programming, for example, if it's a very programming heavy type project. Yeah, or if it's something that requires very you know, specific types of music or sound, we'll bring in a, a sound designer. Yeah, or fabricators, for example, um, when it comes to installation work. Yeah. Yeah. So we do kind of collaborate with others, but I guess the core team here is just is just Chad and I. Yeah. 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 We've been trying to come Power. up with a, a yeah. name for us. We we haven't had much luck with it. So we're just Chad and Helen or, or Helen and Chad so far. <laughs> yeah, so there's no studio name. You, you're not, not, yet. Like not yet. creating a studio. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Um, your journey should definitely go on. It's a wonderful journey and I really like to listen to it. Uh, uh, wonderful projects and uh, it was also uh, wonderful that you joined this Hong Kong Museum um, game jam we did together with Tatiana. Um, yeah, hopefully we see us very, very soon. And thank you so much from wait, my wait. side. Yeah, thank I also have a question here. still. Oh, you have a question still, now? Question. Okay. Yes. Are there, are there any artists you would love to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Ooh. Oh, I'd love to work with Kaho. Kaho Abe. Um, yes. We meet quite mm. frequently, just, just chatting about our practice and our work and what we've been up to. And we've always been saying, oh, you know, we'd love to do a collaboration with her and um, make something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Kaho would probably be my go-to as well. Um, I'd also love to collaborate with Alistair as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alistair Aitchison. And yeah, that like both of their works are, are fantastic and so fun and playful. I think having like a yeah. collaboration would be great. Yeah, great the, so yeah the, and also the alt control community. Like everyone's so supportive and... Um, I feel like it's such a it's such a great community to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. One more last question. Yep. Just one. Um, maybe it's just a short answer. Uh, it's uh, for chat because I mean I really appreciate your work what you did with uh, Free Play Festival um, as an artistic director and also all the exhibitions you're doing over the last couple of years and um, why 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 this journey ends. Um. Well, I think. Um, first of all, like it's it's been a long and and tiring journey for me. Um, I feel I feel like I've you know achieved a lot of things during the last five years as as artistic director. 
Um, and, and I now stand as the longest, longest um, serving artistic director of free play. Um, usually I think the, the time is probably two years. Some, some people do one, some people do three. Um, but, you know, it's really important for free play to stay fresh as well and for new voices to come in and take free play to where it needs to go next. Um, the, the one thing I fear is that by me leading the organisation, that it kind of stagnates a bit just because I have a certain way of doing and delivering things. Um, and so that's why I thought it was probably a good time to, to let someone else um, take over. But that being said, I think my curatorial practice has not ended here. Like I'd love to continue curating exhibitions and events. Um, and, and I can do that, you know, through, through Hover Garden, which I um, co-direct alongside Andrew Brophy um, and, and just my own kind of independent artistic practice. Um, that's something I definitely won't be um, stopping anytime soon. Um, I probably do need a bit of a break um, and I don't know how long that break will be, whether it's six months or two years, but um, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be heading back in there and, and making stuff again, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I also have to think about um, stopping a maze. What? <laughs> uh, I mean, just yeah, <laughs> direction. <laughs> stagnating only is not stagnating no. the years. oh <laughs> the supporting is getting old now we need a new director what no um, um, <laughs> but yeah okay wow thank you so much breaking news yeah no it's not, it's not over yet it's not over yet it's not over yet no worries, no worries. <laughs> okay okay thank you chad and helen uh, have fun in Thank the Q&A on Discord um, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the festival. Stay online, stay in your May space and uh, yeah, we see and talk each other very, very soon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank see you, later. you so see much. See you later. Evo. Bye.